you dream of a classroom where learning is natural? Can we inspire students to lifelong learning? What exactly is the purpose of an education? Inspiring students to be curious, independent, creative, innovative, deep thinking, confident, proactive, collaborative, determined, educated. Rise to the challenge of changing the world. This is teaching. This is learning. This is who we are. Welcome to the Tabletop Inventing Podcast. Do you have teenagers? We often think of teenagers as difficult or challenging, but is it possible that they are really the most innovative members of our society? How much could a teenager create if they had the right tools? Join us today as we discuss the potential in those wonderful years of teenagerhood. Warning! This is a Lister Advisory. The word amazing is overused in this podcast and will have to be retired from the English language after being so overworked in this episode. Today's podcast is going to be a little unusual, but not in the way you might think. I'm not going to let you in on the surprise just yet. Instead, I'm going to share one of my favorite quotes by George Bernard Shaw. The reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. <laughs> I, I've always wondered a little bit if I'm unreasonable because I've always tried to remold the world to suit me better or to match how I think the world should operate. Mostly this drives my wife crazy and I get misunderstood a lot. However, with the help of some friends of mine, I'm starting to get better clarity at uh, what we do and why. The suggestions of my friends actually inspired this particular episode of the Tabletop Inventing Podcast. So here's the secret for today. Today's guest is me. Well, that's not the only secret. The host for today is a former guest of the show, Jody Mayberry. Now, Jody and I hit it off well in our interview that he and I did this year. And I would have to say that Jody is a great guy. He hosts two other podcasts, the Park Leaders podcast and the Creating Disney Magic podcast with Lee Cockrell, who's the former EVP of Walt Disney World in Florida. And I'm just going to turn this over to Jody now. So, Jody, take it away. Well, hello, Stephen. I'm I'm a little impressed you would turn your show over to me. <laughs> well, there's no telling what's going to happen. Uh, you know, <laughs> it is you and me, so it is hard to tell. Well, thank you for the quick introduction, Steve. I am the host of the Park Leader Show. I was a former park ranger, which is where that show comes from, and also creating Disney Magic with Lee Cockrell. And at least for today, I'm the host of Tabletop Inventing. So I get to add that to my resume, which is quite a pad. But we are not here to talk about me. This time, Steve, we're here to talk about you. I'm just going to give a real quick rundown of your credentials because I, I don't think you do that enough. Let me just say some things and you can fill in what needs to be filled in. You have a P PhD in physics from Case Western Reserve University. You have technical expertise in building, testing, and using lasers. And, and I kind of feel like I should uh, say <laughs> that like Dr. <laughs> Evil. <laughs> lasers. You've worked for the U.S. Navy as a civilian researcher building high-energy lasers, and every time I've ever asked about that, you've actually threatened to kill me if you said anything. <laughs> don't, don't tell anyone that. I'm actually a nice guy, Jody. <laughs> <laughs> you are a professor at Loma Linda University creating dental applications for lasers and electro-optics. And I know I said that, but I have no idea what I just said. Um. Uh, just uh, basically, anytime uh, light hits a detector, you can do all kinds of things with that. That's what electro optics means. Okay, and I know you love to build unusual things. What falls in the unusual category? What falls in the unusual category? Um, well, building is kind of a um, a loose term. I probably shouldn't admit this. I actually enjoy doing crazy things. Like I have a cargo container out back. Normally you see cargo containers, you know, out at Long Beach or in ports. And out in the desert, lots of people have them because you're just looking for extra space. But I have another cargo container. It's not really hidden, but it's it's buried or at least partially buried. 
despite all these things I've just listed that you've done, I was surprised, or maybe I shouldn't be, to find that, that you don't even list any of that in what is your proudest accomplishment or will be your proudest accomplishment. Tell me what that is. Well, I'm a father, and my wife and I together have eight kids, and I think that my proudest accomplishment will be graduating all eight of my kids into a successful life, like not to have any kids living in my basement or, uh, you know, coming, you know, coming back when they can't seem to figure life out. I'm, I want to launch them out successfully and have them, you know, start companies or go, you know, work for someone and do amazing research or, um, you know, whatever it is that they choose to do that I want to see them out being successful. And I, so far we are, uh, three for three on that one. Uh, we have kids out figuring things out and, uh, it seems to be working, so I'm I'm excited about that. Oh, that's great. You're off to a great start there. And you've done so much already. As a father myself, that really means a lot to hear that that is where you place your what you're proud of and where your accomplishment really is. So now you are the guest on Tabletop Inventing today. And let's start right there from the beginning. Why did you start the Tabletop Inventing podcast? Well, originally, uh, I was interested in talking to amazing uh, educators uh, who are out doing cool things in education, you know, changing education, particularly with uh, maker education and the whole maker movement, maker spaces. But as I started interviewing people, I quickly found out that there were these amazing stories. And I like to call them educational histories of these successful individuals. And I just started asking amazing individuals to come on my podcast from all across the the career spectrum here in the United States and asking you know what what was it that brought you from grade school or you know high school to where you currently are now and those stories were just really enlightening uh, truthfully I, I was actually scared to death to monologue without a script and at some level I still am which is why I asked you to come be the the host here today because I mostly I need I don't like to just stand up and monologue, you know, but the podcast was originally started um, as a way to hear to hear these amazing things. And it's evolved into this thing where now we we hear stories like how do you end up becoming a park ranger after being in finance? Like, how do you do that? And then I had this p cool person on called Jody Mayberry, and he told us, like, how does that happen? <laughs> One of the great things for me about being a podcaster is the things that I get to learn, I, I guess that's kind of my secret is I host podcasts for other people, but the entire time I'm learning while I'm doing it. So that's really great. That's one of my favorite things about podcasting. So when it comes to tabletop inventing, what have you learned from your podcast guests? Well, I didn't realize that that was going to be part of the process. You know, I thought I was going to go out and interview these people, and they were going to say cool things, and I was going to share with the world. What really happened was I went out, I talked to cool people, and they started teaching me things I didn't know. Um, and I started to see patterns that I hadn't, uh, I hadn't expected. Um, it turns out that successful people have a lifelong pattern of learning. Like, they just choose to learn throughout their whole life. It becomes a habit. Um, it turns out that trial and error is probably the most successful method that these successful people use uh, to learn things. You know, they, they don't just go read a book and then go, go do cool things. They try something, find out how well it worked. Sometimes it works great, sometimes it doesn't. They change up their methods and try it again. And, and through the process of trial and error, they, they learn how to do these uh, amazing things or they end up in these amazing places in life. Um, I discovered that the the path to success for most of these people was not a straight line. They didn't start off in high school or college and then shoot straight into their you know career where they were when I interviewed them. Usually there's this circuitous path that leads all over the place before they end up back um, where they are when I interview them. And I think that as humans we're just we, we love to hear a good story and I think internally we each want to live in a good story. And a straight line is just not always that interesting. So I, I, I think actually we do that somewhat on purpose, even though we wouldn't admit that we do that. I also learned that uh, what, we, what most people call failure is really a laboratory for learning something that I've actually uh, borrowed this word from people called resilience. You know, when you fail, you have the opportunity to stand up 
and realized that this was part of that trial and error process, that you adjust your practice, you adjust your, your ideas, and you try it again. And it's that willingness to try again, that resilience, that truly is uh, a core uh, facet of the character of people who go out and succeed in life. Most good ideas actually start off as bad ideas, and so you can't expect to go out and have a success the first time out of the gate when you're doing something uh, really, truly innovative. These ideas start off uh, really rough, and then you have to do the process of trial and error, loop through them until, you know, you know, maybe on the second or third or fourth attempt with slight modifications each time, you start to get into the flow of something that truly works. And honestly, through the process of starting the whole Tabletop Inventing podcast and, you know, the Tabletop Inventing company, we've learned the same thing. It's these, these truths seem to be consistent across every sector of society. I mean, I've talked to lawyers and CEOs, and I've talked to uh, educational professionals. Um, I've talked to park rangers. <laughs> I mean, just everyone seems to have the same story, you know. And I also learned something that was a little bit, it was a little bit uh, disturbing. I mean, I've got a PhD. I went out and I spent all this time getting, you know, very educated. And when I talk to people who have, you know, amazing success, they ha their success doesn't appear to be correlated with college. And I find that personally, um, I don't know, it's a little bit difficult to hear that, you know, being, being educated. Because I, I truly see the value of an education. But I think that education is something that happens in the mind it isn't something that happens to the mind and so you can be educated and never step foot inside of you know a, a college or even even a high school um you know there's certainly evidences of that in uh, some of the stories we've heard like the kid that built the windmill in africa i don't know out of like bike parts did you hear that story no i don't know that story anyway I, well i'll link that up in the show notes but there there are all these stories of people who go out and learn things. And so education really is something that ha it's a frame of mind. It's a, it's a, a place that you go in your, in your head. And so if you go to college with that, then you get a great education. You take that and you go out into life and life then becomes your great education. College doesn't guarantee that you're going to succeed. And I found that to be disturbing as I, you know, as I talk to people, because quite a few of the people I've interviewed on the podcast, you know, before I interviewed them, I didn't know that they never had a college degree. You know, they just went out and did, through the process of trial and error, they learn from life and then use these lessons to succeed. And so I have. I've learned a tremendous amount on the podcast uh, throughout the last uh, almost year and a half of, of interviewing people. Now, you talked about education and you have a Ph.D., so uh, you do this with guests quite often. Are we going to do an educational history on you? Uh, we probably should, um, but I actually... I actually today would like to, to head in a slightly different direction because I want to specifically talk about some curious things that we've learned about teenagers. So I'll probably have to invite you back in the show for the educational history. So we should actually plan that sometime. Okay, if we're not going to talk educational history, take just a minute and tell me what tabletop inventing is all about. I think you're trying to trick me into the educational history thing anyway, but I can't resist answering a question like that. There are a couple of things that, you know, in our history of starting the company that, that are important, what, you know, tabletop inventing is about. We started off thinking that we were going to sell 3D printers to educators. Like, so we were going to be a, a distribution chain. And I very quickly discovered that I was going to get bored to death in the distribution uh, model. Like it just wasn't interesting enough to me. And, we by accident actually taught a little summer inventor camp, um, you know, in hopes of you know getting some data about you know how teenagers might use a three D printer, and we just fell in love with this idea of teenagers and inventing. And inventor camp has actually become a cornerstone product for us. And every summer now, uh, we actually do inventor camps in uh, one, two, three, three, and sometimes four. We might even hit f one, two, three. We might hit five states this year. I'm not sure. We've really gotten excited about teenagers learning to invent, and our four-day inventor camps are uh, a place for teenagers to come and learn how to 3D print. Uh, they learn how to uh, program uh, specifically, not, not just like programming a website, but uh, programming little microprocessors, something called an Arduino. If, for those of you who are familiar with those, they're amazing. For those of you who aren't familiar with them, they're just a tiny computer that's like $20. And so because it's only $20, it's 
we can afford to have them program it, make some mistake and break it. Like it's just twenty dollars. And so, you know, they plug sensors into these things and uh, motors and LEDs. And so you can make robots. We, uh, the first year we made top secret security systems with them, and the students had to use uh, two sensors, one that uh, sensed when some, someone was nearby and one that sensed when they were tampering with the device that they were trying to protect. Uh, this last summer we did uh, Asteroid Lander, and so they had to cr create uh, a little landing crane similar to the Mars lander uh, when they dropped the Curiosity onto the planet and use their learning to create a motor that ran in the right direction and use a sensor to stop it and bring it back up and they had to 3D print all the parts that they needed and that sounds complicated to most people but truthfully teenagers can learn all of that in four days it doesn't take any longer than four days to take a teenager from I don't know how to do any of that to I just built uh, you know an asteroid lander uh, for my project and we also do teacher training we work with uh, community colleges we've worked with universities um, high school systems great uh, elementary school systems and we really want to see teachers using hands-on education because when students engage their hands as well as their eyes and their ears and their sense of smell in the learning process the act of adding you know the manipulating things with your hands it physically changes the cognition your you know how you consider a problem is different um, I think different pathways open up in the mind for problem solving that you don't see in other ways it's also true that a student who is solving a real-world problem you don't have to create this huge infrastructure for doing you know what everyone likes to put in quotation marks critical thinking all you have to do is say okay um, your challenge this week is to build a security system. Here's the parts. And then you just stop and let them figure out how to use the parts, how to c combine them. You know, they can go look the things up on the internet. Um, they can ask you questions. And they just learn by starting to put these things together. And so teachers, I, we want to see teachers watch this happen in action, and we want to share this with them. So we've worked with teachers uh, also in, you know, I hate to call it professional development because in the education world, professional development kind of has a it's, – it's, it's like saying eating, you know, broccoli or Brussels sprouts. But um, when we do professional development, it's actually a lot of fun. Um, and we're experimenting with some after-school inventor clubs similar to our inventor camp but for after-school type situations. But what I'm really excited about – as a new project we're starting this spring for high school students and it's called the Resonance Innovation Fellowship. In this uh, we're, we're taking gifted students who and most people don't think about gifted students as an underserved population in the educational system but truthfully gifted students are typically bored in the education system and they do one of two things. They either get um, straight A's or they uh, get horrible grades because they're bored and goofing off. I want to take gifted students who are already uh, on the end of the spectrum where they're going to succeed, and I want to ask, how far could they really go in this? Like, how how much is possible? All right, Steve, tell me more about that last one, that Resonance Innovation Fellowship. Like I said, I'm really excited about it, but I actually think I need to tell you a story, and I know I think it'll set the tone for what this group is all about. In your mind, Jody, imagine that the year is 1812, and the United States is at war with Britain, and the USS Essex, uh, which is a ship captained by David Porter, is patrolling the western coast of South America. Now, aboard is a young midshipman named James. Now, he was the youngest officer in the U.S. service at that time, and the little secret is that James was ado actually adopted by Captain Porter after his mother died of yellow fever, and his father didn't feel like, like he could give this, uh, his, his son a proper upbringing. So he'd been uh, the foster son or uh, the adopted son of uh, David Porter for quite a while. On this particular voyage, uh, David and James uh, are both going to f make history. And in their exploits along the coast, the USS Essex has managed to capture so many ships as prizes, and that's what they, they were called. They are called prize ship, prizes, um, that they are running short of men to command them. It's late afternoon, and Captain Porter just called James to his cabin. 
And he tells James, James, I need you to be the prize master of the Alexander Barkley. Now, for a moment, James is just standing there with his mouth wide open. The prize master is an interim captain of a ship in the event that they capture a prize. And so uh, someone from your crew would go uh, aboard the other ship and captain the ship back. And usually this is someone, you know, who is a senior member of the crew who understood things pretty well. But they were so stretched out as a crew. They had captured so many ships that they were down to the midshipmen, which wasn't a particularly high rank. And James didn't even know what to think about this. And we don't exactly know what happened in their conversation. But we do know that a few hours later, James hauled his little sea chest full of belongings over to the ship called an Alex- the Ag- Alexander Barkley, which was anchored off the shore with a number of other prize ships. Um, and all of these were under the command of David Porter of the Essex. And James now had the dubious task of sharing the captain's cabin with a surly Captain Randall. <laughs> now, he was the former commander of the Alexander Barkley. You can imagine he was, he was not very happy about this. And that first night, Captain Randall spent most of the night drinking and complaining about being captured. And James was awakened the next mornings by Joseph Hawley, who was a loyal comrade who had come from the Essex. And he said, Mr. Farragut, they're flying a signal to get underway, sir, but I fear that there will be some trouble. Hadn't you better come on deck, sir? Now, from a deep sleep to that. And so he gets dressed pretty quickly, and you can imagine his mind is a little muddled as he comes up on deck. And he's not really met with a flurry of activity from the ship getting ready to sail. Instead, the men are huddled around the small groups around the ship, uh, actually looking a little bit belligerent. And Captain Randall, who had refused to even notice James looked even more surly than the night than the night before and you know he by this time had plenty of alcohol in him and was you know just all ready to make a a big scene but James had been at sea long enough with Captain Porter to know that he had to take action right then he couldn't simply but but he had he had difficulty here mustering the courage so he told Captain Randall the former captain to order the ship's preparations <laughs> well Obviously, Randall took that well. He sneered, stuck his hand in his pockets, and he just laughed at James. Well, I think at that point, James' courage probably waned a bit. But he remembered what it was he was supposed to do, and he turned back to Captain Randall, and he said, My orders are from Captain Porter. We must set sail for for Valparaiso. Well, Randall, oh my goodness, I mean... (laughs) He was, he was just not going to do this. And so he, he basically laughed at James, kind of said some nasty things to him. And this is the point at which things changed because James had a little bit of a temper. James promptly turned his back on the captain and he looked at the men around the deck and he yelled at them to prepare to set sail at once. And Joseph Hawley, who, who had just woken him up a few minutes before, he, he jumped up and went straight to work doing what it was that uh, he needed to do. And several other men kind of watched Joseph and realized that there was a choice to be made, and a couple others joined. And before long, the whole crew was actually getting the ship ready to sail. Well, Randall was obviously not happy about this. He cursed and told the men that he was going for his guns, and he'd shoot anyone touching the ropes. And when he, But when he disappeared below deck to go back to the captain's quarters, James hollered down after him, and he said, Don't you dare come back on deck or your life will be in peril. And then James turned to Mr. Hawley, who had been the one to uh, wake him up in the morning and was, you know, the first one to jump into action. And he said, if Randall comes back on deck, throw him overboard. James managed to keep control of that ship, the Alexander Barkley, and to play some slick politics. And he captained that ship from the coast of Ecuador, 3,000 miles down to Valparaiso, Chile. In honor of his adopted father, James changed his name to David, David Glasgow Farragut, and later became the first admiral of the United States Navy. But at the time of his first command, there aboard the Alexander Barkley, David was only 12 years old. My goodness. So what is it that you take from that story? That story grabbed me the first time I heard it, and I wondered, like, are there other teenagers 
stories out there of you know teenagers doing amazing things? And the answer is a resounding yes. As I went looking, I found more and more. Mary Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein, you know, she actually published it at 19. So she must have written it when she was 17 or 18. The, the guy who invented the snowmobile, he came up with the idea when he was a teenager. And I could just keep going down the list of, you know, people after, you know, person after person after person who, as a teenager, did some very amazing things. After reading all those stories and thinking about this, I realized that teenagers have much more capability than we give them credit for. And I'm actually curious to find out how much, you know, can a teenager actually learn. So how, how does that play into the Resonance Innovation Fellowship? Well, the purpose of the, the fellowship is to get a group of teenagers together who are all interested in doing some amazing things you know and in learning you know most teenagers they probably wouldn't tell you that uh you know some specific thing they want to do but they want to do something that is has impact you know they want to do something that's amazing or they see some cool thing on youtube and they want to you know they want to try that if you put these teenagers together in a group and you give them the right tools and the right experiences they will they will create on their own we we would look at it and say there's no way a teenager did that there's actually there's actually a, a current story of a young man named Easton La Chapelle, and I'll link that up in the show notes. But uh, he has created a robotic uh, prosthetic hand that's operated by your thoughts, and he released the plans last year or this year in January, but in 2015 uh, as open source. And he and his friends are basically trying to completely rewrite the rules about prosthetics and he started this when he was 14 that's incredible to hear stories like that i don't think that is probably the picture that comes to mind when you say teenagers to most people no i don't think so i, I i'm a parent i have teenagers and one of the first things that comes to mind when i think about my teenagers is you know that that they're a little bit opinionated you know you give them some idea and they say oh no i've got a better idea and our society has just pasted all these things on them. You know, in a former time, when you became a teenager, you were an adult. You know, you started taking responsibilities on the farm or you started taking responsibilities in your parents' business or you went off and you got, you know, educated and started your own business. Teenagers are act were actually, the, the idea was invented in the 1900 because before you were either a kid or an adult. I don't think I ever realized that, that teenager was an invented term or even an invented idea. I actually would like us as a as a culture to rethink teenager and rethink capabilities of teenagers. And you know, I'm specifically aiming at high school students with with this, but I think eventually, you know, we'll include middle schoolers because as soon as you are able to think critically, you're able to think in a nonlinear fashion. We need to help teenagers grab a hold of their creative abilities and give them some structures. As adults, you know, we can go out and read about things like Stanford uh, has this thing they call design thinking. And lots of people now use design thinking framework. Well, why couldn't we teach that to teenagers? There's, you know, there, and there, there are just hundreds of other things out there where teenagers, they need a little bit of a framework. You know, we don't have to teach them hundreds of things, but if we taught them two or three uh, frameworks for how to think, how to innovate, how to how to approach a problem consistently so that you're not spinning your wheels all the time. They're already excited. They already have lots of energy, and they're already very creative and intelligent. And if we give them these these structures and these tools, what could they create? So tell me how you set this up. How What environment do you give for students where they can find out more about themselves and what they can create? Well, the the structure currently is that we would meet once a week digitally, and then the, throughout the month, the students would be separated into teams of three, and the teams would work together to create a particular project, and they get to choose the project. So it's not me assigning a project to them or the you know the fellowship assigning a project to them. They're choosing a project, so they already have investment. They already have decided when they start that they're interested in it because it's something they want to do. And my job then is just to help them choose a project that's big enough because normally teenagers start off with something that's kind of small and easy. But truthfully, if you give them a big challenge, they will step up to it. They really will. And so my job is to help them choose a project that is big enough that it'll cause them to stretch, something they couldn't accomplish today but they could grow into over the course of a year. Most students, most teenagers, don't think, they don't do a lot of self-reflection. You know, they're, they're busy becoming themselves, 
but they don't really know what that means. And so I'm going to have them do that on purpose, have them take some personality assessments, have them talk to each other about things that they like and things that they hate, and help them create a picture of who they are on purpose, not by accident. I want each student to go through the process of learning and then see the process of learning and then become an independent learner so they don't actually need me to teach them things anymore. They can come ask questions, I can give them shortcuts, but when it comes to the learning process they become the masters of their own learning. Most students don't even do that until they get to graduate school, which is sad because every student is capable of becoming the master of their learning and the, the ones that do really well do it earlier. I also am specifically putting the students in groups because collaboration is the framework that they're going to come into on every project that they solve uh, in real life. Real projects are done by groups of people, not by individuals. They need to learn the skills to effectively choose their best place within the collaboration to work with the other people in the group and say, well, I think I can do this well. You know, do you think you could do this? You know, and, and to negotiate until they have a well-functioning, you know, powerful team to solve a problem. And so the self-discovery, the independent learning, the effective collaboration, and the last one is practical leadership. In this process, each person on the team is going to have an opportunity to lead the project through different phases of development. So they're going to have very practical experience in meeting deadlines and meeting a specification and setting goals and then reaching them. One person is going to be responsible through each of those phases. So each of them will get an opportunity to exercise practical leadership. These are skills that are important that they could learn other places but aren't typically focused on. But they're the core. We started this interview talking about the podcast. Each of these successful people knows who they are. They have a very strong picture of what they're capable of. They understand how to learn on their own. They become lifelong learners. They learn how to collaborate and work with groups of other people, and they learn how to lead and be at the front. I believe that those things can be taught to teenagers, and I believe teenagers can learn them early. And if you could learn them early, how much further along the curve would you be if you learned it at uh, 14 rather than, say, you know, 34 or you know, 44. What kind of commitment would students have to make to get such dr dramatic results? Do they have to live in a commune in the mountains <laughs> for a couple of months? <laughs> uh, you, you know, Jody, it's, it's not that complicated. I, I think teenagers need to learn to live in their natural environment and learn to innovate in their everyday life. This project is something that comes alongside their regular life. They will have to make some choices and commit to this they may not be able to do every single activity that they plan. They may have to you know, make some specific time for this. There's a weekly time commitment for getting together, and then there's two-day face-to-face meetings three times a year. And the rest of the time is time that they schedule for themselves outside of those things to, to work on their own projects, to collaborate with, you know, within their smaller teams. Honestly, I think it's you know between five and eight hours a week, depending on the student and depending on how much time they they want to put into it. You know, I think they need to put in a minimum of you know four or five hours a week into something like this because great things take great effort. If you think about how much time teenagers currently spend texting or playing video games or you know watching TV or in some other hobby that they have, there's time in their schedule to do this. Teenagers that are truly interested will. They'll commit that time. I've I've seen teenagers willing to do that. It might mean watching less cat videos. I don't know. I like my cat videos, Jody. <laughs> <laughs> I think the average teenager, if this is something in their brain, this is going to be something that begins to consume a significant fraction of their thinking because they're going to get excited. Once they realize that it's starting to come together, they're going to get excited because they're starting to do something significant. I mean, imagine Easton, you know, who made this prosthetic hand. You know, I imagine by about 16 when he had his first couple of prototypes done, it was on his brain all the time. And so much so that when he graduated, I mean, he's, he started a small company. They, they call it Unlimited Tomorrow, and I'll link those things up um, in the show notes so you know people can look it up. I think if you asked him, he would tell you that it consumes a large fraction of his thinking. And I think it started to do that even while he was in high school. So I think initially there's a commitment to the process to, to get over the first hump. But I think once you get past that and you start to see the significance, you know, and you start to see the excitement, I, I think it's I think it's self self feeding. I think you won't be able to stop it. It'll become like a you know, a, a an, an 
a runaway reaction. It'll be it'll snowball. They'll just get so excited they can't not innovate. They can't not lead. They can't not do amazing things. Mm. Well, Steve, as we wrap up, I'm going to hold you to questions that you like to ask guests. <laughs> I was wondering if you're going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> In the digital age, what does it mean to be educated? To be educated is just getting those structures in your mind to to be able to function well in your society or across multiple societies. And in today's in today's environment, you can learn those things from YouTube. You can learn those things from Wikipedia. You can learn those things from places on the internet. Um, you can also learn them at school. You can learn them from teachers. You can learn them from mentors. Uh, we just have so many avenues open to us now. I don't think there's any reason for us not to be educated. I think education is extremely important, whether you get it from formalized educational system or you get it you know, informally from online or from people you know. Okay, the second question then, what is the purpose of an education? Let's see. I think the purpose of an education is to open our mind to the other possibilities out there. Yes, we want a framework for seeing our society and for understanding things, but I think what education does is it allows us to see that there's more. And the more you learn, the more you realize there is to know. And I, I don't know if you've ever talked to someone who has a PhD or someone who's you know, become a lifelong learner. There's this pattern. And it is the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. Because the more you know, the bigger the playing field becomes. And I think the purpose of an education is to open up our minds to the point where we can, we can have as big a playing field as we want. And I think that's why yeah, I, I can't, like I said, I can't keep talking about this Resonance Innovation Fellowship thing because, honestly, I want to see students open up their playing field so broad that they could do just about anything that enters their mind. And I would, I think that is really the purpose of an education, to open your mind to that point where you could do anything. Okay, Steve, thank you for being a guest today on Tabletop Inventing. Thank you so much for, for hosting this and turning this around and doing a reverse podcast with me. I, I think I needed that in order to actually be able to say some of those things. I, don't, I wouldn't have been comfortable monologuing that. Yes, well, it, it went well. And on a final note, if somebody wants to find out more about the Resonance Innovation Fellowship, what should they do? The best way to find out about the Resonance Innovation Fellowship to get more information is to actually email me. And I normally don't do this. Um, my uh, specific contact information is not floating around on our website, so this is a special episode. But you can uh, email me directly. That's steve at ttinvent.com. That's S-T-E-V-E at T-T-I-N-V-E-N-T dot com. And just say you're interested in RAF or the Resonance Innovation Fellowship and uh, we'll we'll talk from there i've i've got quite a bit of information that we can share and i'm excited i'm i'm looking for a s small group of motivated teenagers and so if you are one of those teenagers or you know one of those teenagers we should be talking <laughs> <laughs>